Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's episode. Hopefully my voice is loud and clear. An interesting title has found me tonight. And that is the idea that time, the concept of time, is timelessly marching in the void and it's as if human beings as intelligence have emerged and as intelligence <coughs> we have defined intelligence and this world metaphorically can be seen as a canvas and so our emergence is the paint and now our emergence is a movement that means if, if a person does nothing in human existence you're kind of like being the paint on the canvas but if you are if you have inspiration or <clears throat> there was the concept at least in rock stars had it of the muse you know or the collective muse another word for that would be ethos it's as if it's not enough to just be a paint in the canvas, one must be drawn, one must draw their life in the void of this earth, <clears throat> and at the end feel their masterpiece is complete. And even though Salvador Dali says, do not seek perfection, you'll never reach it. Thanks, Salvador Dali. <laughs> but he's right, he means that uh, in, in this life, in this world, it's strange. It's an incredibly, <clears throat> large system we're incredibly small part of it in front of our eyes we have no other choice to base our language based on the observable and visible and tangible uh, stuff and the small right so so we are like a small object <clears throat> inside a big object the world and when it comes to the mind we're like a small subject inside a big subject now the body and the the physical body and uh, you can say the physical world, one can notice the, their separation. But when it comes to the non-physical self or the non-physical world, these are notions that if you have a known self and a known world, the only way you know you have a known self is because there was an unknown self and because there was an unknown world. There needs to be a codependence. considered and this goes to say that the first person who created the concept of time that emerged there was change change is a more ancient concept than time time is a sort of specified change that means ultimately it's this giant space or we can't even say giant because we can't measure <coughs> it we don't know if the universe is finite Excuse me. To continue, pretty much there's a known self, there's a known world, there's an unknown self, there's an unknown world. The unknown self is arbitrary, 
the unknown world is arbitrary and the only reason is it's called it's arbitrary because how we know ourself was a sort of self-selection out of the arbitrary that means one can say did imagination beat reality or did reality beat imagination which one um, uh, beat the other and getting to the realm for it. That means to this day, there can be no school of thought I personally find that can make clear whether the mind was in the room before the body or the body was in the room. It appears to be simultaneous. Even the concept of time we can pinpoint objects in time. You know, we, a person goes to the same spot, let's say twice, <coughs> let's say there's a park and you go to that park um, twice, you go on Wednesday and you go on Thursday. The only thing that separates those two moments in the space-time continuum is the additional dimension of time. What that means is if the person was living in a film that they could never rewind, there is no time because we can consider because we can uh, hold points of reference. Time has shown itself as a reality. are timelessly experiencing time and our retaliation to the void is our life. One can say what is the meaning of life if you opened your eyes and you had a paintbrush in your hand and there was an empty canvas and there was a <clears throat> and the paint had and the paintbrush had paint on it and there was different uh, colors to reality, different selection of free will of different colors, like the person can't select the brush, they can't select the canvas, but they can select how they use the brush uh, on the canvas. This world is uh, so strange that certain schools of thought, ancient schools of thought, they give up on the world. Their ancient mysticism pretty much is like we're in the wrong room, get out, you know. <clears throat> Modern mysticism is trying to escape where it is in the room and it's trying to go towards the more yeah, non-human. That means that the most dangerous thing about the New Age community is that uh, uh, they are become it's dehumanized in a human space. That is dangerous usually. In any group, let's say there's a bunch of human beings, <clears throat> and these human beings are going, you know, just as they are, and suddenly one of the human beings, imagine, feels he's a bear suddenly, you know, or feels like they're a dinosaur or something. Right, that human being starts behaving in a way where it's alarming to the others because it has, in some sense, dishonored the, the law of the humanization of the tribe.
What can I say? <clears throat> we are human until we are not. And that's pretty much history for you. Time <clears throat> uh, is for objects. We can pinpoint objects in time. We cannot pinpoint subjects in time because time is a subject. The mystery of time being a subject is like a disguise. It is like a mask. And what is it masking? It is masking the unknown depth of direct experience that surpasses the fixation, the strength of any uh, indirect ideology. You see, words are a strategy of uh, generating micro experiences to kind of fathom the big experience. But direct experience is like jumping into the big experience. That means like people try to conceptualize like truth. And let's say truth is jumping in a song. Imagine a bunch of people <clears throat> beside a swimming pool. Instead of jumping into the swimming pool, one person uh, scoops some water with their head and splashes it on his face. Oh my God, is this the experience of the swimming pool? Another person, <clears throat> I don't know, puts his whole hand in the water and it's like, oh my God, am I experiencing the swimming pool? And in all cases, as long as we're not fully <clears throat> in the swimming pool and our head is not underwater, we cannot have any declaration as a species that we know the unknown. Like, what kind of belief do people expect even in a changing world? I mean, that's a, that's a bigger question. The purpose of the objective dimensions of human intelligence are obvious. Continue. That's it. That means that's what that's the purpose of the body. Continuity. <clears throat> and continuity and also coordinated work which is going to help with the continuity but your the physical purpose of life is to in some sense um, stay on the roller coaster and until it's like you will never know the meaning of physical life until we fully experience it you know sometimes I feel could reincarnation hilariously be like a restaurant where imagine a person's gone to a restaurant and the the chef the chef is bringing them food like straight from the kitchen you know like <laughs> movie movie level <clears throat> you know uh, you know Italian mobster movie level of respect no I'm joking. <laughs> and so <clears throat> what happens is imagine the chef brings you your meal you know the main dish and you're eating this meal. And you eat it halfway, and the chef at the end of it, and let's say you, you you can't eat anymore, and at the end of it, the chef is like, "How was the meal, right?" And then the person's like, uh, "It was good," or they could say, they could say it was good or bad, but that meal is left, like half the plate is left of the food is left on the plate, right? So in that case, it's it's this weird thing where the chef keeps bringing back the food, as if the person keeps eating the same food until something clicks and they're like, why am I eating this, you know? <clears throat> and then they move. There's an experiential level of life and when it comes to that, I'm telling you, no concept surpasses it. This is why I have a comfort with language because I, I, I've understood its hollowness as a reflection of the directness of the experience. Somebody said we, um, I don't know who it was, somebody said we don't see how people, are. we don't see people as they are, we see people as we are. Which implies self-reflection, which implies that we are, uh, the brain, are, every person's brain is like, let's say, running a program. And that program is the filter where all the senses of the outer realms are gravitating towards, you know. And so the whole point of free will and living a human life and all this all talk in history of 
liberty <clears throat> and championing man's freedom, mankind's freedom. It's as if like all of that is to go to say that mankind's true freedom is to be. To be the world. We are returning to nature. We don't realize it, but we're consciously sense treating life like a square and there's four corners to life four dimensions that all human beings wherever you are you must care for and for human beings it comes to them differently <clears throat> let us say there is a season of the known self there are moments in life where let's say the person will know themselves more than the world I've had moments where I've known what I've wanted I have had no clue what others wanted you know, there's been moments where I have known what others wanted. I've had no clue what I wanted, you know. There's been moments where I've I had a clue what I wanted and what others wanted. And it was a clue where I had no clue what I wanted and I had no clue what others wanted. I can't tell you how in this life how much of this life has been just me <clears throat> walking in the... Pre me existing in the presence of my own mind. You know, and when you really get acquainted with your presence... It's not that fear goes away, it's that you see more dimensions to fear. So fear actually has a, a quicker chance of being dismissed. You see, in, in life, what do we call it? Um, uh, pleasantness is towards knowledge. When we know something, we're like, oh my God, the sun is shining. You know, it's a sunny day. <clears throat> you know, when the person has known, has understood something. But when, when an unknown comes, most people fear it. Most people feel judged by the unknown. And I feel out of 8 billion human beings on this planet, <clears throat> how many are just existing? How many are piloting? Because to pilot your existence experientially is the whole... Uh, um, I shouldn't say whole, but it is what we find in life. I mean, it's like when a person knows themselves, sure, they can use language to pinpoint some sort of location in the moment. <clears throat> but when there is no language, when the person realizes there's an unknown self here, and there's an unknown world, that means whatever people do, we can't know it. It's unknown for a reason. Right? It doesn't mean we can't we can't know it as the known. What that means is, um, if I wanted to stay true to all my memories, um, I would never be human. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is that in order to be human, one has to let go of the past. That means you can have, you can see a human being, and they could be possessed by their past. <clears throat> in this planet, on this planet, I will tell you when, when it comes to the analysis of human nature, I would say you know, fundamentally, like if. If I had to say it very quickly, I would say there's givers and takers, right? <clears throat> and there are those who are taking to give, and there are those who are giving to take as well. A person may in one moment feel like doing something 
as a known entity. Then they go, it's like imagine you have a known idea on yourself and then you have a known idea on your world. That means you know yourself in one, you find yourself in a moment of being where you know yourself, you know your world and you implement a strategy and that's technically certainty, right? We call that certainty when you know yourself and know the world. <clears throat> Whenever there is, when you don't know yourself but you know the world, we call that doubt. When you don't know the world, but you know yourself, potentially, we call that confusion. And there's so many dimensions to human beings. It's like, we, we thought we, we had to go to the Museum of Modern Art to see modern art. Every human effort of existence, of being animate, is art. Like, somebody please tell me, what is the difference between life and art? <clears throat> you know? We are the universe's artwork, just aware that we have been painted. You know, I had this view uh, after reading the Puranas, uh, this text by, uh, written by Rishi Vyasa, and Rishi Vyasa. <coughs> and In the Puranas, they suggested that human experience <coughs> can dismiss itself out of clarity into incarnating as an animal with the full totality of all its memories. So there has been stories of yogis that they have done the wrong things and they've incarnated as an animal, but an animal that has had a full awareness memory of all its lifetimes. If there is such an implication, this means that we, using the term mind on earth, are making a grave error, and René Descartes' mind-body dualism is the, one of the most strongest arguments for what is going on in this room. Pretty much all the continental philosophers that understood language has an unknown dimension that cannot be shaped. So if a person, person's mind is experiencing the world, <clears throat> let's say your body is experiencing life in a two-dimensional way and your mind is uh, three-dimensionally experiencing life. And so we have all our fear, check this out, we, we have built a civilization where the body We see our body as truth and that is why we can never understand the mind. And even if we see the mind as truth, that is why we will never understand the soul. And if we see truth as the soul, this is why we will not understand the ultimate. And if we see the ultimate as the truth, this is why we won't understand the ultimate. That means there is something <clears throat> where I would say Rene Descartes' mind-body dualism and Lao Tzu's tout in the Tao Te Ching, he says action through inaction. The infusion of these two is like, I don't know how to say it. It's it's literally like in a battlefield where <clears throat> a general is on, uh, it's, like the, uh, it's like the odds are against the general and then out of the sky, like this giant robot lands his back on you. Like it, it, it's like these two ideas infused and enmeshed into civilization uh, uh, through the cultural programs, leniency for a new multidimensional era. <clears throat> you know, who says giant robots can't fall from the sky, you know?
okay. The chat section seems to be alive. The chat section is alive. <laughs> but anyway. Ultimately, guys, I'm just thinking of uh, constantly in all these talks I've given, I've just come to trying to see reality as it is. And when my ideological, all the ideas and beliefs I have on the world, when they did, when I discover that uh, attention is an unknown attention, is simultaneously an unknown experience, is simultaneously being a known existence, their simultaneity is that is in the middle of these two. Uh, ideas and their instantaneity I have found the heaven where I where my voice comes from the pure lens I have found has been in the instantaneity and in this simple thing where I was so shocked <clears throat> you know I was under the impression that materialism entertained a temporary philosophy on life you know but when one looks at science they suddenly realize oh my god energy can't be created or destroyed so technically the thing that is causing all of us to be here is something that can't be created or destroyed yet we're here as as people saying that uh, uh there was a big bang there was an origin it's a, it's, so you see it's either we got to make up our mind as a species either it's infinite or finite if we can't make our mind make up our mind we got to entertain a yin yang civilization i feel the way as a backup system the best way to design civilization <clears throat> Like if we cannot find a singular abode, we will aim for the dualistic. If we can't find the dualistic abode, we will aim for the multidimensional. If we can't find a singular abode, the void is already there. That means when it comes to emptiness, I have more experience being non-existence than being existence actually. <laughs> you know, for billions of years I didn't exist then in 1991. Wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so we have not existed more than we have existed you know there's nothing to really fear you know it's uh, at best life is an opportunity that if you in some sense cared for it you saw it I feel everything else is a distraction to one truly looking at this life and watching a, a, a book with where the truth has to be there before is like a notebook right because you got to think about it a free being doesn't is not going to look for freedom that means any human being who wants to know <clears throat> they are free or not if you are looking for freedom you're not free because think of the real realism of somebody having freedom, they would be moving on to something else. That freedom would become second nature. The whole effort of humanization or, or the grand effort of human beings is to some, some degree stabilize that it is okay to change in a changing world. And society stories which are changing slower than the natural realm have to be able to either be lenient multidimensionally or speed up. There's two options. <clears throat> two options. Either all those elites empower somebody as if, um, <clears throat> you know, they, they raise a flag and all the most powerful people on the planet starts running like a marathon. What are they running towards? They are running to see what is the most advanced activation of 8 million creatures on, uh, in the void. And so this will in it bring us to, again, the grand march, the timeless march of time in the void, which is another way of saying, who is history here for? Why do we need history in the void? You know, it's as if, all right, you know, though this is the big first chapter of history. There was nothing. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's like <laughs> the first human beings didn't exist, you know. We could be the shadow of eternity right now, a temporal universe. Think of a 90, think, oh my God, this is a really interesting metaphor I can use. 
Think of a person where their back is to the sun and the, their shadow is on the ground and they are looking at their shadow. <clears throat> and so it technically means the truth is a right angle <clears throat> to their shadow. Is it, that means when you look at your shadow in 90 degree turn, that's where your truth is. If you are looking at yourself, you're, you are parallel to the truth. That means the shadow self is perpendicular to truth. The, <clears throat> the true self, the real self, um, or the real understanding of the self, that is parallel. So they're, they're, I could say there's human beings <clears throat> that are perpendicular, yeah, and parallel to truth. Those who are parallel to truth, you don't know you are truth, but you are. Right? Those perpendicular know they are not truth, but because they are not truth, they have only truth to go to. And truth is not, uh, you know, um, what a, um, uh, just a series of words placed in front of one another. Truth is an event. I can't, uh, reg regardless of all the language I hear from the moment I wake up to the moment I sleep, all the different imagery, all the different phenomena <clears throat> and design that visits me, The attention is not only beyond human, it has known itself beyond human way before being human. And so there are levels. It's as if a person, it's like they told the yogi, all right, you gotta see life as a dream and then wake up from it. And the yogi is like, all right. So the yogi wakes up from the dream and then, oh my God, is there another dream? Then another dream? then another dream, then another dream. And so in some sense, there is no point of waking up in infinite dreams. <clears throat> that means you can't wake up in an infinite dream, in a dream where endlessly, it's like imagine the inception, but like <clears throat> it wasn't just like a bunch of realities in one another, it was infinite. It would literally be meaningless. That means we have realized that when you fast forward meaning, it becomes meaningless. And if you preserve meaning over time, it becomes meaningless. There is no way out. Just like how our body, just like how our biology, <clears throat> right now people don't understand. History, our view with history is going to change. <clears throat> and I feel we should give it a new word even. I think it wouldn't it wouldn't be history if history was his story then we need we need the collective story the collective's story which is collective story I don't, I don't know it doesn't sound right <laughs> oh my god what word should I use history Let's, instead of calling it history, maybe I, we should call it the past's future. I don't know, neo-history, I don't know. <laughs> You know, imagine time <clears throat> was personified. Oh my God, guys, I finally found the word, but it's a, it's a ridiculous word. I don't think the audience is gonna. Okay, so I was thinking what would be a new word for history. <clears throat> and, um, 
I thought, what if we spell it H-I-S-S-T-O-R-Y, history, and for the first time human beings have treated history like a snake, where it sheds its skin. That means it's as if history, it's as if arrows of the realm, right? So it's like it's history. <laughs> You know, this is a ridiculous comment I'm going to say, but imagine the history of all those people on the planet who've said, psst, psst. <laughs> it'll be pistory. <laughs> this is getting out of control, so I guess. <clears throat> Pretty much what I'm trying to say is um, the body, I mean, ultimately, um, um, we are using time. There's, there's two dimensions to the intelligence. The object, um, if I go back to just like the starting point, the object um, it has to just behave so you have a body and the body is waiting for the mind's instructions and you have a mind where the mind is waiting for the body's readiness right <clears throat> that means if a person's body is not ready they cannot you know let's say um, you know, perform athletically so it's like a synchronization between the inner realm and the outer realm and in the middle of these two ways of the world being a new story needs to arise that is so multidimensional that we are like time for who? Time in accordance to what? That means who is the creator of meaning in the void? And so I feel this is hilarious, but when in, in, in polytheistic religions, they say everybody is God, <clears throat> you know? And they say this is the difference between uh, Islam and, for example, Hinduism. Where it is in some sense in Islam, in monotheistic religions, uh, it is uh, everything is God's. That means God owns it. Everything is God's. And in uh, in the polytheistic tradition, you take the uh, you take uh, it. Everything is God's. Everything is different types of God. Everything is God. And so when you think about eight billion emergent types of intelligence that can just create as if. Uh, uh, we are all technically the gods of the meaning we create as we decide. So it's as if we use free will to make a decision. The decision becomes the solidification of reality. And then we, it's like we cause, from, it's like there's a causal position as if we uh, roll the bowling ball and then it hits the pins, the effect, right? So the causal position is a free will <clears throat> that it, it, it stands as mystery, but at the same time, in, in at least religious circles, they saw your, that the, the individual had a soul and the soul was God. <laughs> that means it's as if the soul is the hand, the mind is the puppet, and the mind's behavior is kind of like truths, elusive show. Without action, promises are void. You know, I, I'm looking at this wallpaper of the talk and I'm thinking, what if all these flowers have suddenly came alive and started naming themselves? 
and started uh, having philosophies on life only to realize that they're all being the par a part of the nature of their world. And so to discover one's true nature means to discover the inseparability of one's intelligence with all that is being around them because we cannot ignore how the edges of the sky are also the edges of our mind. And so the mind stands as an arbitrary kind of dynamic force. That means it's as if, if a person doesn't do anything, if you were like a statue or life was like a photo, we would never know we have a mind. But it is how this object animates, you know, at a faster speed than its environment that we can tell it apart. That means if a person was moving, let's say, as slow as it... Um, um, like if a person... I, I'm, I'm just constantly... I'm trying to say that it's like... Uh, there is a force that causes us to be animate. And we tend to, everybody should see themselves as a causal position endlessly. Like from the moment you wake up, you are emanating energy. You know, people don't realize it. Everybody is giving off the at their core essence what, what sort of energetic phenomena they are. That means uh, the presence of human beings are glowing. The mind's presence has a glow. And so we transcend beyond a phase where mankind is scared of voices behind his eyes and voices in front of his eyes. That means history is just the inner realms and outer realms becoming more like each other. The future is a great balance. It is the complete equal sign between. Objects and subjects becoming the same element. We're becoming the same. The dual universe is like two sides of the, of the same page. Everybody is in one world. But many worlds are within each person. How does one even compartmentalize their memory? Like, so, you know, people say that uh, <clears throat> you need to have an individual personality in life, but uh, our personality is made of fragments of memories. That means I think it's impossible to be an individual self and there could be the illusion and the appearance of an individual, but because there's so many memories, how could the person have only one state of mind? It's as if each of our memories or a, ver or a moment where we were a self in a world and so it's as if that that uh, that the geometry is imprinted in the brain or even in a mind beyond the brain A savage species <clears throat> that sacrificed its savageness to see how advanced the gifts of, intel an, of an intelligent nature are. You know, it's as if we don't realize this is it. This is life. There's a poet by the name of Attar. He says, Atar says, be happy for this moment. This moment is your life. This moment is where all life is happening. The only mantra, the only affirmation. 
that the unknown stands, you know. I feel civilization 1.0 has bored itself towards a sort of hopeless anguish and in slowly being replaced by the machine room. The civilization needs to be treated as if everybody is on a battlefield. Not a single person is off this battlefield of civilization. We are at a war. The whole species is at a war of the natural. It's like not only we have to worry about natural disasters, not only we have to worry about our management and <clears throat> physical survival through like consumption of and our relationship with all the other species. Do you know? Not only we have to prepare in case if an advanced species come. That means not only we have to quickly finish this episode we're having with animals and find technologies that can replace food and start the species disturbing nature, <clears throat> right? Because it's as if like um, some people believe in karma, but then it's like they go and butcher cows. Like it's it's like it's like it's like it's like remarkable, you know. <laughs> So, so there's there's something about the species endlessly eating a lesser species that is a bit weird, and not that it it's not it's it's I shouldn't say it's weird. It's actually our natural evolution. But I'm saying, it seems to me that we can bypass it through the advancement of our intelligence. That what that what I mean by that is uh. I would say maybe 70% of the human population is, is moving their, their living as bodies that are howling their mind around. They're being an object that is moving subjects, they think. That's the notion. But I'm telling you, those people who realized the mind was in the room before the body, there is a strange freedom. It's as if the aftermath of freedom and now the person's like, what do I do now that I'm free in all this emptiness? <laughs> and then you know there was a sound in the distance and somebody shouted you know from universes beyond hey maybe create something you know and so creation is is sacred and this is something that uh, in some sense uh, women know by design It's as if we are like an energy expanding its energy before its framework dismisses. It's as if a caterpillar <clears throat> being uh, going into a cocoon and becoming a butterfly. And then what, what do we do with all the caterpillar's beliefs? What do we do with a civilized? It's as if we've built a civilization for caterpillars, but the, in the future we're all going to be butterflies. And people are like, no, it's okay. You know what? This is progress. It's like progress for who? James, uh, in the chat section, um, there's a misunderstanding you have, I find, on the concept of philosophy, right? So if you understand it's void and we are speaking, um, you would never write a comment like that. Ah, bless. 6.37 p.m.
poetry is not dead, but it's definitely not welcomed in modern times, it seems. You see, we think reality is firm. We think reality is linear. We don't realize in the middle of a giant emptiness, uh, we have emerged, brains have emerged. These brains are projecting personalities. These personalities are overlaying a subjective uh, world on reality, and then we're making a decision, you know? You know, and people are looking for valid points in the void. Invalid, invalid, invalid. And so this rage must go. It, it's, it's deeper. I am telling you, you know, James, uh, you are an example of civilization 1.0. And thank you for sharing. The story of the world has brainwashed people in not entertaining reality from different angles. It's like you can look at an object from different angles. Who says you can't look at a subject from different angles? But people are so obsessed. You know, I understand the difference, but we don't even have the discrimination. That means nobody was saying this, you know. But when it comes to the inner realms and the outer realms, We must tame the beast within, and the outer realms must deserve what the future's eyes deserve. Forgive and forget, because all goes forth. <clears throat> In a multi-dimensional reality, how can we pinpoint validity? This is a good question, maybe. Maybe I'm explaining a multi-dimensional context, and so the listeners are like, this is invalid <laughs> in, 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 in the dimension I see, you know? And there's no, there's nothing wrong, I would say, with being a fool. Because one is born a fool. Everybody's a fool. The whole at at attempt is before we die, we get to see as much as possible. And our mind gets to experience and see how many other ways the ge geometry of the realm can be accessed. Because to be honest, the future has nothing to do with us. What we, in what we do, will have uh, will suggest what the future has to do with itself. society for the individual to trust them and so the challenge is in a changing world
honestly, it's this music. This music is like eerie, kind of like you know, transcending the universe kind of music. I gotta change it. <laughs> This one seems to have more of a presence. Okay, <clears throat> so um, You know, some 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 nights, guys, I treat the talks like uh, just a free notepad where I can draw any curved line. In, but uh, maybe I should probably have more structure. I mean, <clears throat> maybe there's a point here. You know, <laughs> it's like how do we give mysticism a structure? Okay, how do I give the void a structure? <laughs> Technically, I I feel if anybody understands what I'm saying. That means they understand the unknown. Because all I'm saying is after I read Socrates, he said the only truism is to know that you know nothing. So there is no self-glorification when we're temporary creatures, literally temporary candles on the surface of the planet melting. Right? So there is no there is no game of, oh look at this is me, oh my god, look at that is you, you know. That that just that is boring. It gets boring. Then the true intentions of the living being while they're alive arise. When these true intentions arise, then you have strength in your presence because you trust your life. Why? Because it is, in some sense, the candle again. It's glow. It's like every day happens once. Like, what greater motivation does a person need? You know, being a philosopher nowadays will save people so much money in all this, you know, self-improvement that is going on. <laughs> The hardest truth that the world could not hold. That the world doesn't have to mean anything. It can just remain as a, a ultimate simplicity. A simple presence. No suffering, nothing. Or you can choose to perceive it in a hyper complex way where there's various narratives and, you know. Every person has their own karma with uh, what uh, the world shows their eyes, I find. In my personal school of thought, I uh, see that in the outer realms, we advance civilization. In the inner realms, we advance communication. 
the whole point of communication is that every person is like their own universe they have their own inner realm and when two people speak it's as if they're from their inner from one person's inner realm inner universe a satellite is going to the other person's universe right and the other person is re receiving it from their own inner realm that means when two people say they understand each other it's technically impossible So in a world where it's more of a question mark than an exclamation point of a declaration of uh, a sort of judgment of value, we have to learn to live with the question mark and then treat the exclamation points as pretty much the effort of life explore. That means an advanced civilization is pretty much like a giant football team where the coach is like, all right, you know, we're all going to go and, be, uh, you know, play the game. And what is the game exploring? There's no greater work, no, no more honorable work than exploration. It is one of the quickest ways to restore where it's like literally it's built in where we we found stuff back in the day in hunter gatherer societies and we're like yo look at what I found berries you know and then everybody had blackberries and uh, <clears throat> you know uh, capitalism got heavy you know We are honestly 8 billion characters in an elemental video game. A video game where instead of pixels, it's the periodic table. And it, I think this is a very, like I feel this is a very interesting idea that we don't have a view where that, when a person is unconscious, we say they have logged out of their consciousness. Or let's say a person is about to fall asleep and somebody's like, hey, you know, where did you put this thing? You know, and the person's about, <laughs> about, about, let's say, about to fall asleep. It's like that person is logging out of consciousness, you know? So we can we can start using, I don't know, as, as a species, at least trying to see what other ways our eyes can open to the world that is already here. So you see, this is the issue. When truth becomes a declaration, when we feel truth is an object to have, it could be the biggest mistake that the analytical philosophers are making. You know, <clears throat> you see, we need, it is true, we need a human headquarters. That means, uh, for me, I know that an um, uh, airplane needs to have two wings and a, a, and a proper advanced civilization needs to have a complete immaterialistic edge of civilization, a complete materialistic edge of civilization, and an authorization for a spectrum of all, you know, civil, uh, types of cultures, um, I should have said culture, types of cultures in between, <clears throat> right? And so it's as if, like, what do we do with the world story where on some level we are generating it and we're even logging into it and based on how much we care for the video game we actually get to play it well that means for somebody who wants to leave this world but wants good things to happen is what like it's like there's there's a uh, paradox you know you know how many people right now want to get enlightened but they also want to have a lot of desires so it's like a giant paradox you know i want to get enlightened but after all my desires <laughs> you know You know, anybody can be an enlightened soul, you know? It's like as easy as wearing clothing, but I'm saying like in, in the attention of the presence of nature and to wonder about what is truly going on. People don't realize, look at, look at really what has happened in history. Before there was science, you know, as a field, it, there was philosophy. Philosophy was pretty much ask a question, where am I? Like any, any like philosophy you can, you know? <clears throat> the first philosophers were probably human beings freaking out how everything was just here and they were like, how, how is this here? You know? <laughs> so science was a branch of philosophy and science is a through a certain method we are answering certain questions of the world but philosophy is the governor of the questions of the world. 
And what I mean by that is it's pretty much the wonder, it's, it's like man's civil relationship with the unknown is called philosophy. And without honor, no soul can be freed. I don't even know how it's possible if the person can't find a presence to be true to or true as it's like the person has no justification to have the strength in the person to be a to be a personality of their own. That means there has to be like one has to first. Um, um, it's as if the person has to realize they don't know enough about themselves to have an opinion on themselves. <laughs> and you realize they don't know enough about the world to have an opinion on the world. But at the same time, they have a voice and they have a mouth. And so we've created civilization where people live once a, a lifetime, but it has been a censorship of validity of truth. Do you know? And this, the only issue is, is because civilization through after idol worship now to the era of language worship, ideal worship it's like we're still trying to choose between one or the other the moment the species realize civilization can be redesigned multidimensionally not dualistically which it is now right now things are good bad good bad like button dislike button you know <laughs> and you know i was like how hilarious you know it's like the the creators of youtube could have just um in some sense not put the dislike button you know, <laughs> and every every YouTuber would be happy. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> look at how many likes I got. You know, because nobody knows in the vastness of uh, out of eight billion human beings, w which center of an ideology we begin uh, um, 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 centering certainty. You know, and for me, the the most important concept is the communication. If the communication of the civilization advances, the rest will come naturally. So if there was philosophy first, science branched out of philosophy, then the great, great war of the analytical philosophers and the continental philosophers began. The analytical philosophers won that voice. The, 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 the lions of continental philosophy died out. And so in some sense, the analytical philosophy has built a culture more fascinated about a technology's appearance rather than the morality and the ethos, the world story that is required to govern uh, 8 billion creatures in the void on this, as Buckminster Fuller and Marshall McLuhan said, a space ship earth. When will the rage of the true human being be seen here. Not the ideal, ideological entity, not the entity that has war paint of this culture, this society, this nation, this color, class, creed. It's like, what is this? Costume games till the end of, uh, till, till the day we die? Like, it's like there has to be something more here, you know? <clears throat> and so it has to be a collective embrace of a multidimensional system that is content with the void, content with the singular, and content with the dual. Then true era of multidimensionality begins. Then teachers, will ne there will no longer, it, it, like this concept of somebody is right, somebody is wrong, will become obsolete. It would be as if every person is just seeing a certain dimension, and you can even have a percentage of how much of that percentage is from their inner realms and outer realms. <clears throat> you know? That means it's going to become way more calculated. It's just that nobody has given it geometry. And this is why I'm saying that the future belongs to the designers. Now it's like slowly the karma of the planet is moving where the geometry of the civilization, the, the, geom the, the, the man's relationship with geometry, man's relationship with language, and through the abidance of honor and exploration that means the greatest honor is exploration the greatest exploration is honor you're trying to find the uh, not the highest ideal not the one ring of an ideology <laughs> to rule them all but but in some sense the real event the original earth <clears throat> it's as if we're all trying to find the world as it was before we were, as we were.
you know, they say freedom of speech, but they don't say it gets filtered through <laughs> through endless emotional, you know, viewpoints. You know, in some of the talks I have said, Imagine if we had jetpacks and we were looking at the earth from the sky, you know, and we were like, all right, let's see how, if there were extraterrestrials who were stealth, how would they think? How would they meditate on this image? Right. <laughs> and imagine, imagine, so we see, and ultimately it's like either you move as an object or you move as a subject. And now I'm saying more than ever, there needs to be a tolerance for multi-dimensional uh, subjectivity you know I mean we have to of course maintain I'm saying kind of like uh, building four uh, columns four pillars uh, as dimensions that the civilization is gonna in some sense stand on you know we have to be able to have a complete relationship as, as human beings with the void a complete relationship with our, our mind which is the whole moment a complete relationship with how the content of our mind is dual and then to realize that inside the duality we have found a way where once you have uh, there's no need for three four five six seven all those dimensions after duality it's you have infinity You know, maybe the best, <clears throat> maybe I'm overthinking it. You know, there's, it, it could be that we just deserve to live like squirrels and birds on branches. We just have to be a peaceful creature eating food from a tree, lying down on grass, and that's going to be our heaven till the end of time. You know, or are we going to get realistic with the tools and technologies that are accessible both in the outer and inner realms? on this earth and we start doing something about it people don't realize because the world is unknown because we because john snow doesn't know anything you know, <laughs> you, know you know nothing john snow though human, humanity doesn't know anything right now because the species doesn't know it has to assume some sort of format or function so the the, the structure uh the civilization 1.0 has has to have a vision right so evolution uh, i would say darwin really painted the picture well there <clears throat> that the purpose is just gene transfers as if we are a shape we are a genetical geometry and we're passing away this geometry we don't think about why is this geometrical shape doing this you know <clears throat> It's like, why did the self-replicating gene become an arbitrary awareness to how it is being that gene? Like, this is, this is like some next level, you know, somebody has to say something. <laughs> All that I'm saying, and I've concluded this, that in the outer realms, advancing the advanced civilization is the greatest game to play, is the greatest strategy. In the inner realms, we advance communication, and what that concept means is that the mo we are the most advanced communication of the earth, and the most most advanced communication 
is in some sense how man is inseparable from the universe. That means right now our body is from the earth, but we are saying our body is separate than the earth. But technically, as attention, if René Descartes' mind-body dualism holds, uh, the attention is, is technically... Uh, how do I say it? The inseparability of mind and body would be just the soul's life. That means the soul's uh, left uh, eye is the human body. The soul's right eye is the unknown mind. And so these are like two eyes that are seeing the same moment, two dimensions simultaneously being there. Let's say in 200 years, the civilization realizes language is hollow. <clears throat> we realize everything we have learned in regards to performance in the outer realms an observable universe makes sense but the moment there's an unobservable universe all our observable universe is the tip of an iceberg so we cannot ever declare truth so the truth that truth is literally out out of the window as an option in this modern world of um, in the linguistic simulation You know, if people expect the precision of machines from a biological creature, then nothing would be good enough. We have built a civilization where it, it is mechanical and it is in a strange way self-serving and because it's self-serving, people are prioritizing serving themselves and imagine a world where uh, in the future technology is doing everything that a human being can do physically and so human beings are left what do we do you know all the jobs taken the only solution would be to now begin living the mind's life that means we have to be everybody can now start preparing for this giant shift this giant shift of uh <clears throat> How would I say it? Like, when the soul of man leaves, the world was never the world. <laughs> you know, Anytime I've become upset, uh, the past has actually helped me, you know. I've looked at the past and I'm like, okay, back in the day, people were so savage that everybody was like killing each other, you know. <laughs> now, this civility is, is like way more an advantage, you know. And it's like when we, when I think gratefulness is gratefulness, you know. <laughs>
time is marching towards the timeless, <clears throat> this means that uh, time is our choice. A human being can live on this planet as if time doesn't exist. Albert Einstein sa had said this thing, uh, he had this quote, he said, we created time so everything doesn't happen at once. I mean, way before time even existed, we were living in a timeless reality, right? So we have actually experienced living in a timeless reality, not consciously. Now, if we were to consciously experience a timeless reality, if the consciousness is only defined in time, we will never be able to understand. So the, I think that it is in some sense meant that uh, neurology will never understand how the arbitrary spontaneity of psychological symbolic acceptance occurs. That means there's no way we can give a personality to, uh, to, to an object. You know, <clears throat> the great. A philosophical war of human continuity. Right now, three armies are at the, uh, fighting in the war the past, present, and future. Then it's going to be two armies the present and the future. Then the present and the future will become a new present. The future is the destiny of the past. That means our life's value is only in how it completes to the end. All right, let's go into a quote tunnel. Let's see what people have said about time. William Shakespeare says, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. <clears throat> Benjamin Franklin says, lost time is never found again. Ivan Turgenev says, time sometimes flies like a bird, sometimes crawls like a snail, but a man is happiest when he does not even notice whether it passes swiftly or slowly. <clears throat> as, if he, uh, as if Ivan is, uh, Tur Turgenev is saying, uh, time is, uh, happiness is timeless. It's a timeless state of being. Giordano Bruno says, time is the father of truth. Its mother is our mind. Wow. Oh, wow, wow. What, what a quote. It's like we can't know the known self without the unknown self and in a society that's trying to know everything and it forgets that the unknown is there, it, there is self-suffering and anguish, self-anguish. Right now is, is, is a time where people have to all be uh, explorers for the sake of civilization. I mean, at some point it's going to advance. If we don't do it, the future generations will eventually, somebody's going to be born and be like, hey guys, should we advance this? Like, you know. <laughs> you know. 
So anyways. My final comment uh, for this episode and of course to the listeners. <clears throat> um, when I give these talks, I'm just a human being talking. If you see it as that, just a human being. Eight, there's 8 billion human beings on this planet and in, in the world there's 8 billion, uh, not, excuse me, not 8 billion, there's a billion trillion stars, you know. <clears throat> so there's a lot of, there's a, it, just in our universe suggests, you know. But, uh, so in a world so vast, what are we doing? judgment it makes no sense when there's this much unknown around so the only proper retaliation of the advanced communicator should be exploration but exploration with the decency of a win-win algorithm and strategy that means we are trying to live uh, find a way where human beings can live a life and civilization can have a structure where civilization wins and human beings win right and so what that means is human beings are the backup system to the civilization the civilization becomes the backup system to the human beings right now we have an experience in advanced civilization right now it's like we may think we have advanced from people back in the day who like uh, you know lived in just you know uh, who didn't have homes and you know were traveling the forest or whatever but but it's like this is not progress enough it is progress but not enough Right? Because the inner realms give us access to how much more it can advance. That means what man should do is not become a machine, but be endlessly inspired by machines. That means it's as if um, we're trying to create a sword, not to use it, not to ever wield it, but to just, you know, frame it and look at that sword. It's like, oh my God, you know, <clears throat> Valhalla's, you know, calling me. <laughs> Honestly, if one uh, realizes it is okay for the unknown to be unknown, there is no longer an identity to the moment because one realizes the moment changes. That means, let's say the person says, I identify with A, the letter A, okay? And, and somebody says, I identify with the letter B, but the moment the person says, I, I identify with the letter A, when the moment changes, the identity changes. So we are like an endless self-updating intelligence that that's how we're coordinating through the environment, right? So there's stuff happening in the environment and there's ways that we are, pro uh, uh, what's the term? Uh, there's ways that we are projecting Civilization just has cared for knowledge, and that's the big problem. It's at least it should be fifty percent unknown, fifty percent known. Then we try to find a response to that, right? But when people are saying it has to be known twenty four seven, and if it's not known, they're gonna fight over their beliefs. Like that's that's ridiculous impatience. That's the immaturity of a species. You know, not having the tolerance to realize that the mind grants a multidimensional atmosphere where we are not bound by the words that we witness. So when you realize you are the observer of the phenomena, you are not the phenomena. You know, there's there's something there. There's something there that it's like if you if the person like if the person was uh, inside a house, they cannot see the house from the outside. You know. So one has to be outside of the house in order to observe the house. And it's as if people are inside their psychologies, as we, in quotations, call it. Call, call, call. But, but in some sense, even the word psyche, its root means spirit. And the spirit was the unknown mover in the realm. And when this spirit was recognized as the whole moment, it was called the logos. When it was and recognized in the individual, it was called the soul. When it was recognized through, in some sense, everything, it was called God. But ultimately, it's unknown mover, unknown moving force. I would say that is that is that is the most. I think that is the healthiest approach, where it's as if something unknown is happening to something that is knowing that unknown to a certain range. You know, in a certain range. 
the timeless march of time in the void. Marcus Aurelius says time is a sort of river of passing events, and strong is its current. No sooner is a thing brought to sight than it is swept by, and another takes its place, and this too will be swept away. St. Augustine says, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain it to him who asks, I do not know. Exactly, because language is dualistic and time is actually spontaneous acceptance of our reference. You know, so there's that reference is really, how do I say it? Like it's, <clears throat> the wilderness of this realm surpasses our language. And in all these talks, if I have somehow been able to make the listener realize that you're not a thought, and that is a confusion and misinterpretation of even Rene Descartes' uh, glowing wisdom. What else can I do? Okay, I'll, before I end off, I'll make this an activity. So for all the listeners, um, in the comment section, write your opinion. What should 8 billion uh, creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere do? And I want to see in the comment section answers, you know. That means anybody and any answer is welcome, you know. Aeschylus says time brings all things to pass. I feel like reading one more. Time and tide wait for no man. Jeffrey Chaucer. Anyways, that's that's for the cold tunnel. Thanks for listening, folks. Namaste. No,